Quark, is there a, a prefect session coming up? Yeah, there's a prefect session uh, up today in this room at 8.30 to 9.30, um, particularly to go over any lab questions you have. Uh, I'm considering about hosting something on Friday to give you guys a final exam review for, for you to take the exam. Uh, and that would be the last prefect session of the time, uh, because I'm heading home on so, um, Yeah, that's all. Awesome. Um, reminder that uh, our quiz eight due 9 p.m. tonight. It's one question that I think you should hopefully find uh, pretty straightforward. So just remember to take a look at that. Lots of good uh, discussion on the check-in form for lab seven. Uh, some good advice there. Uh, any questions on, on the lab? Uh, People have been. Uh, how many vertices and edges are the small or the large and medium? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Let's see if I can quickly find the answer. Um, so the large is almost eight thousand lines the file and it looks like it's mostly um, and if it's like an average of three classes per person it's like four lines per person so like 2,000 people um, but I don't know how many unique courses are in there um, so uh, but on the like thousands of vertices something like that for the large and, and medium probably hundreds would be my guess uh, other questions Uh, when you start making the schedule, uh, you can just choose an arbitrary class um, to get started. Uh, there's like the algorithm does not specify a way in which you um, just that you like choose a class and then you add as many classes as you can to that exam slot and then you move on. Um, so you could choose a random one, or you could have some other method of picking kind of which one to start at. Other questions? All right, so a couple uh, reminders related to the calendar. So there's a final exam <coughs> study guide linked uh, from the calendar. It has a number of problems similar to the ones that you can expect to see on the final exam uh, and has answers as, as well. All of the questions uh, are conceptual. Given this scenario or given this thing we want to have a computer do, either like it's either kind of design kind of a, an interface or a class, like what sort of functions or methods would you have to, to make this work? Uh, and also what data structure would you choose and why? Um, and there are kind of examples uh, like that. Uh, to remind you, the mechanics of the final exam will be available uh, starting Friday. It will be on Gradescope and uh, it will be uh, due, um, this should say 9 p.m. But it will, it will, the exam will say and the calendar will be updated 9 p.m. Uh, uh, Wednesday, the, the 16th, end of end of exams. Any questions on the final? Rebecca? Is it timed? It is not timed. You can take as much time as, as you need. Uh, I expect the exam to be three to four hours. Christopher? Is it something that you have to take on with the sitting, or are you able to close it? Uh, you are able to save your progress and come back to it. Um, uh, Gradescope has a little, the interface is a little weird. To save your progress, you submit, but then you can just resubmit and edit the answers that you already put in. And I'm only going to look at them after the deadline. Um, so you basically can submit and resubmit uh, to kind of work on it, spread out over time if you want to. Um, I, I should say in the exam, we'll, we'll remind you, uh, it is kind of open notes, open book, 
Uh, you can write Java code and, and test things out if you want to, though um, there won't be anything about uh, Java programming specifically on the exam. Uh, anything linked from the course website or calendar, you can consult. Uh, you should not, but otherwise the internet is closed. So um, uh, my, uh, uh, my expectation is that you are kind of not just scouring the internet for all possible information that would be a violation of, of academic integrity. Rebecca? Is it your box? Uh, yes, yeah, so there'll just be text boxes and you'll be uh, uh, typing in your, your answers. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm not looking for, for length necessarily. Um, so, uh, as you can see uh, uh, from the, the example answers on the final exam, like a few paragraphs, that is almost certainly going to be, be sufficient. Um, so, like, clearly describe your choices in this scenario and provide some justification. Quack? I was curious, so for these questions, is there one correct answer, or if you can argue them well enough, is there, would you pick that one? Uh, the, so I am mainly interested in your justification and not like the one correct answer. Now, some choices may be more difficult to justify in a way that is convincing to me. For example, if you choose something that's linear, when you had a constant time option available, that will be difficult to justify. Um, if indeed that operation that is that you have made more slow is like the important one for this problem. But many of these problems will have not one true answer. There'll be different possibilities with different trade-offs and you'll be kind of describing your choice and, and describing why you made it. Other questions? All right, I want to do a little bit of minimum spanning tree practice. Um, so to start out with, I want to consider, we have a connected graph with 10 vertices. Uh, how many edges will there be in the minimum spanning tree? Does it depend on the number of edges in the graph or other aspects, or do we just know how many there will be? All right, so movement toward D. That's great. Uh, why do we know that it, it has to be nine edges? Liam? Um, because the minimum spanning tree is just like the smallest way connecting every vertice, so it has to be like n minus one edges in the minimum spanning tree. Yeah, that if we, uh, if we have, Exactly, we need the number of vertices minus one edges to like connect them all. And then once we've connected them all, if we add another edge in there, we're going to get a cycle. And we don't want that in our, in our minimum spanning tree. That would make it not a tree. Does that make sense? Questions on this? Ron? Does it not at all depend on edge weight or? Uh, which edges? Definitely depends on edge weight. How many edges we would always, uh, because we want to form a tree, it's always going to be the same number of edges. Other questions? All right, for this next one, can someone remind us of like the, the general idea of Prim's algorithm that you heard about last time? Peter? You kind of take an arbitrary node and then you examine all the paths out of the node that you have and you choose the lowest weight one. Um, and then you look at all the paths that are out of the first and out of the second node and choose the lowest weight one out of that and continue with each node you add, looking at that paths and all the previous ones, um, discounting any paths that would make a cycle or would otherwise be ineligible. And then once you finish that, you should have a node spanning tree. Exactly. Uh, we're going to uh, kind of uh, expand the tree.
with the minimum weight edge that is sort of going to bring a new a new node into our tree. Um, what kind of algorithm is this? Like, do we have a name for this kind, Paul? Kind of greedy algorithm. Exactly. This is our greedy algorithm because we're making this sort of locally optimal choice, just like whatever the edges we know about, choose the minimum one each time. Um, and this is one of those nice situations where this, this greedy strategy is going to turn out to give us a globally optimal, the overall minimum, minimum tree. All right. With that in mind, I am going to ask you to uh, first... Can you folks see the, the weights on the edges of this graph up here? Or is it too small? Um, so I'm asking for what is the kind of last edge that gets added to the tree? And I'll make this image bigger in a moment. Um, but your basic task is to, for Prim's algorithm starting at zero, figure out kind of which edges are going to be added uh, and identify which one is added last. And as a note about these options down at the bottom, um, because we're, we have an undirected graph here, kind of the edge between uh, 0 and 2 is the same as the edge between 2 and 0. So I've just listed all the edges down here kind of with the smaller numbered vertex first. But that isn't to say, that, that isn't to indicate like the direction in which we're expanding the tree. It's just the edges go, go both ways. Um, so this, hopefully now a little easier to see, uh, figure out kind of um, how, we're, how we're expanding the tree and what edge is going to be added, um, added to our tree last. All right. Uh, big votes for C. Excellent. Um, that is the, the last one we'll add. Um, uh, the edge between 6 and 8 right here. Um, one important thing that, that came up in the, the discussions that maybe wasn't clear uh, is that when we expand the tree, uh, we're expanding it to any node, to include any node that's adjacent to the current tree. It doesn't have to be like from the last, from, it doesn't have to be adjacent to the most recent node that we added. We expand it to include any node that's adjacent to any node we've already included um, that has the minimum weight edge. Does this make sense? Questions on minimum spanning trees or, or Prim's algorithm? All right, excellent. So, let's see. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's talk about today's topic. Uh, this is a, a pretty different kind of topic than uh, any that we we've talked about so so far because um, we're going to kind of get into a little more about the actual like computer hardware and like things we have to think about with that because a fundamental fact about modern computers is that they can do more than one thing at a time and uh, probably up until uh, up until today, as you've uh, maybe gone through 111 and, and this class or, or other things that you've done, uh, you've probably thought of a computer program that you are creating. It's kind of going through and doing, it's kind of doing one thing at a time. And you can kind of think about what specific thing is it doing uh, at any point. And uh, that makes it easy to like look at a program and think about what it's going to do because it's kind of has a predictable um, uh, way in which it kind of does one thing after another. But, uh, and, and this kind of programming where we're thinking in terms of just like one thing happens, then another thing happens, then another thing happens in sequence is called Sequential programming, kind of doing one thing at a time. And today we're going to remove this assumption that we're doing one thing at a time. Um, and we're going to move to the world of parallel programming. 
meaning that we're not just doing one thing after another. We now may have multiple things that are happening simultaneously kind of in parallel as a computer executes our program. Um, and so it's important to ask, like, this parallel programming turns out to be a lot more complicated and a lot harder than sequential programming. Um, and so my goal today is not that we all come out of it kind of now we're only going to write par parallel programs, um, is that this is so fundamental to how modern computers work that I want to make sure that, that we spend a little bit of time talking about it. That kind of, uh, I wouldn't consider kind of 201 a complete course uh, if, if this never got mentioned. But why would we want to do this? Um, anyone have uh, a suggestion for maybe why, why it would help a computer to be able to do multiple things uh, at a time? Surfing? So like, you, you, you can just have a program which is sort of faster, so like YouTube calls, or like the videos that, like, it's only be able to like watch the video but at the same time interact with the website on YouTube? Yeah, so kind of two related points. The one that I'll uh, uh, have is we, 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 want, we want programs to be fast. Like we expect uh, our computers to kind of respond very quickly, um, to, to finish tasks quickly. Um, and uh, we're always asking computers to do more and more complicated things, to do more and more work. Uh, and so we have to have some way of kind of keeping up with our, our expectations. Um, other thoughts on, uh, on why our parallel programming could be useful? Jake? I guess just using multiple things at once, like multiple tabs or multiple browsers at the same time. Yeah, we have this... Um, kind of multitasking uh, expectation um, of computers where we can have it be uh, playing uh, playing music and using a web browser and using a text editor kind of all simultaneously all these different things are kind of appear as if they are all happening in in real time with kind of no no interruption and so one way to accomplish that is just to kind of have our computer literally kind of doing these things, uh, uh, things simultaneously. Uh, other thoughts? One kind of thing that I'll, I'll say that's related to multitasking is... Uh, having programs be responsive, by which I mean you're writing some document in Microsoft Word and you tell it to save that document. Uh, and it could be that whether it's kind of backing it up to the internet or uh, uh, it might be, I don't know, several seconds or maybe even longer to actually do that kind of save document operation. Uh, but it doesn't feel good and it would be annoying if Microsoft Word just completely freezes for five seconds sort of every time that you save a document. You kind of want to save and then maybe you, you spot a typo and you immediately want to go change it or you kind of save as you're typing just to make sure you don't, you don't lose it. Uh, and so if Microsoft Word were a parallel program where part of it could be working on saving your file at the same time some other part of it is responding to you like, making the characters you type show up, then we can sort of hide how long that save operation takes by having part of the program kind of still active and, and responding to you. Um, so having these kind of multiple parts can, can help with this responsiveness. Um, does that make sense? So this idea of parallel programming has been around a long time, kind of. Uh, since the, the 1950s, um, so it's not a new idea, but I said several times this is fundamental to how modern computers function, because there is something that has changed uh, in, in recent years uh, that make this a kind of 
important important concern uh, in the here and now. And hopefully this will will pull up the figure that I want to show you. Do it not on the Carlton website. All right, so here's uh, a chart of kind of computer technology over time, and particularly we're focusing on the CPU, the central processing unit, kind of the part of the computer that actually sort of uh, executes the operations uh, that your program needs. And so what we see here is time is on the x-axis. And the y-axis is kind of is a, a logarithmic scale of, of different kinds of units. Um, and so an important one to look at is transistors. So these are kind of the little circuits on the CPU that, um, uh, that when combined, uh, uh, actually implement our, our operations. And uh, for a long time, uh, until around the year 2000, um, transistors kind of reliably kind of doubled uh, the kind of density of transistors on a computer chip doubled every every couple of years uh, and this led to a corresponding increase in speed in those computer chips so uh, we went from from doing something like um, uh, 100 operations per second in 1985 to by 1995 doing 10,000 operations per second uh, and then 2000, uh, we're, we're kind of approaching um, uh, uh, um, kind of bi billions of, of operations per second. Uh, and if you've ever seen kind of a CPU where, where it says, like, this is a, a 3.1 GHZ uh, uh, processor, uh, Hertz is a kind of uh, per second. This is kind of the operations per second, and it's 3.1 uh, G for, for giga, for billion operations per second. Um, so trans we were getting more and more transistors, and this frequency, this operations per second, was sort of going up and up and up. Um, but then around 2000, we sort of hit uh, a limit imposed by the laws of physics. Um, the transistors had gotten so small and so dense that if we wanted to kind of make this speed keep going up, the chips would consume too much power and would be too hot. And we just did not have a way to take these chips and keep them cool, basically keep them from melting if we kept making them faster. Um, so... This was a big problem because this whole sort of system had kind of relied on this assumption that things are just going to reliably get faster and faster and faster. And it looked like we weren't going to be able to kind of keep doing that, keep making them faster and faster. Nevertheless, uh, manufacturers found ways to keep packing more and more transistors onto computer chips. Um, but you can see that the, the speed of those chips and the power that they consume uh, sort of leveled out. So we weren't making them faster anymore. Um, what is the line that, that starts going up kind of after our, our speed and, and power level out? Charlie? Cores. Yeah, the number of cores by which we mean kind of Which mean, you know, we, we can't make any individual CPU. We can't keep making that faster, at least not in a, in a sustainable way. Uh, but we can just stick multiple CPUs into a computer. And you now basically have kind of multiple units inside the computer, each of which is entirely capable of sort of running an entire, an entire program sort of on its own. Christopher? Uh, this is a little bit of a 
slightly off topic question, but how do they manufacture a chip that has like billions of transistors with such accuracy that they all like work together and just like repeat it so many times? Um, yeah, so there are kind of two parts to that. Uh, one is uh, people like uh, uh, chemical en engineers and, and um, mechanical engineers and a lot of people have worked very hard to kind of engineer incredibly precise manufacturing techniques. Um, that being said, these chips do not come out uh, reliably perfect. In fact, they come out with all sorts of defects. Um, but what the chip manufacturers can do is they can spot that some part of the chip has a defect and just turn it off. And so they manufacture a whole bunch of chips. Some of them come out great. Some of them come out less great. And the ones that are less great are just slower and are sold as like cheaper, uh, uh, less fancy processors. But it's like the same manufacturing process. It has significant error rate, but that just gives you sort of a range of, of products sort of uh, different levels of quality that you can offer. So um, turns out they, they found a way to, to make money out of, out of these errors. Other questions? Rebecca? How do like the number of cores work together? Because you said there was Yeah, so um, like that is this, this uh, so kind of one thing that multiple cores can do is they can each be doing a totally unrelated task. So like my laptop, I think has uh, uh, four, yes, four, uh, four different cores. So one of them could be doing Chrome, one of them could be doing Spotify, one of them could be doing um, VS Code. And so each of these programs kind of can run as, uh, having kind of their own, their own CPU. Um, but if I want to make the performance, the speed of a particular program faster, I need to have that particular program actually use multiple of these cores at the same time, and that's our parallel programming. So that's what, what I'll talk more about today. Other questions? Hey. In like advertisements, I've seen like there's like there'll be like four cores in a processor and then like eight threads. What would threads be? And I'm also worried about like threading and like is that related and Yes, so uh, we'll talk about threads today. Um, this particular thing about the number of threads being different than the number of cores, it's a technology that, that Intel calls hyper-threading. Other companies have different names for it. Um, uh, and it's basically, uh, you get the CPU to like, you design it in such a way that it can actually sort of do, an individual CPU can be doing two things at once. Um, uh, yeah, there's a little more to it than that, but, but that's, where I'll, that's where I'll leave it. Uh, other questions? Liam? Just like remember something. Like I think the creator of Intel went to Grinnell College. So like they have a massive endowment. <laughs> uh, I did know that Grinnell had a massive endowment. I did not know that it was um, related to Intel, but that, that is interesting. Intel has been uh, uh, very successful. <laughs> All right. so. This is kind of why we have to care about parallel programming. Uh, that computer chips are continuing to get better, but only but you're only going to be able to take advantage of that improvement if you can can make your programs parallel. Okay, so there's a couple of terms uh, that I want to distinguish. There's parallelism and concurrency. So parallelism is the situation where we have some amount of work that we want to do and we want to then kind of split up that work across our available resources. So kind of a metaphor would be, all right, we're, uh, we're working in a kitchen. We have a whole bunch of potatoes that need to be sliced. Uh, 
I could slice all of them. That would probably take a long time. But if each of us, if we could sort of split up the work and each of us sliced a few potatoes, uh, it would go much faster. And so that's this, this parallelism. We kind of take some work and we split it up. In the context of computers, we take some work and we split it up across our, our multiple cores. Concurrency is when we have kind of many requests, many uh, um, needs for, for, for uh, some shared resource, um, and we need to kind of manage how those many uh, requests access some resource. Uh, so again, in our kind of kitchen metaphor, our shared resource is stove burners. We have two or maybe four sort of spots we can cook something on the stove, when just one oven probably, uh, and maybe we can need kind of many things that we need to cook, like many different dishes, many things that need to go in the oven, and we have to have some way of sort of coordinating all these things, uh, accessing that, that shared resource. Uh, and when we're talking about a parallel program, that program might have a data structure that the different parallel parts of it all need to, to access or change or, uh, or interact with. Uh, and so uh, programs will, uh, parallel programs um, will need to, to kind of worry about concurrency. Does that make sense? Questions on these ideas? All right. So... This distinction is kind of not absolute. I, I just find it kind of a useful way to, to break apart things that we have to think about. Uh, and, and today I'm, I'm going to focus on, on parallelism. Um, uh, uh, the kind of uh, computer systems type uh, courses uh, like CS208 or the operating systems or databases uh, or parallel and distributed computing uh, electives Lots about concurrency uh, in, in those classes. Um, all right, so what does life actually look like in a parallel, a parallel program? So we're used to a world where we have kind of uh, uh, one thread of execution. And by thread, I mean just like uh, something that kind of does one operation, and then another, and then another, kind of so on and so forth. Um, and this thread could be like doing a loop or going through an if statement, but it's like you run a program and there's some sort of thread of like sequence of, of operations. So in this thread, uh, we have Uh, something called a program counter, which just tells us like which like which line of Java code are we on, um, and uh, we have some some sort of variables that 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 thread uh, is using, uh, and then we have something called the heap which uh, helpfully has nothing to do with the data structure called a heap. This is just, uh, this heap refers to like, this is literally just sort of kind of a pile of, of memory of different objects. Um, there's, there's not sort of some tree structure to it, just happens to also be called the heap. Um, and uh, there might be kind of some variable that references some object on the heap that uh, references some other object. And in Java, whenever you see the word new, that is creating 
memory for it is like creating that object kind of in this uh, uh, in this area called the heap. So when you create a new array or a new object, it like creates something in this place called the heap. Uh, and kind of what I'm representing here is like we have a variable that refers to maybe an array on the heap and some other variable that refers to an object in the heap that within it has some field that refers to another object on the heap. Does that make sense? So this picture is our single threaded world, our kind of sequential program. We just have one thread, it just does one thing after another. And our kind of new story um, is we're going to add more of these threads that are all kind of doing, doing things in parallel. So now kind of thread one, uh, thread two, thread three, uh, and each of these threads has this stuff inside it. So I have the stuff over here on the left is not shared. By which I mean each of these threads separately keeps track of like which line of Java code is it on, what local variables does it have. Um, and the stuff over here in the heap is shared between these threads. So this is what I uh, was thinking about when say maybe all three of these threads are doing something with an array that has been created in the heap. And uh, I think to Rebecca's question earlier, like how does our computer kind of have these thing, these uh, parallel uh, things kind of cooperating in some way? One way is which they share data. There are things in the heap that they can, like one thread can uh, put a value in the heap that another thread can read and can they can use that to sort of communicate or or, or coordinate. Oh. Uh, would the data in like a heap be stored in a CPU's cache? Uh, so caching is an important topic that uh, I, I won't really get into here. Um, I would say that um, data of all kinds will be stored in a, a CPU's cache because their purpose is to store data that you have recently accessed. Um, uh, but kind of the, the heap kind of lives in, in um, the, the main part of the computer's memory. Other questions? All right, so uh, I'd like to uh, take a, a brief break uh, from uh, uh, parallelism to tell you about uh, Dwight Eisenhower, um, uh, elected president in, in 1952. Uh, as you may know, uh, Eisenhower was a military leader uh, in the Second World War, uh, eventually becoming supreme uh, commander of all Allied forces in Europe. Here's a picture of him talking to, to paratroopers before they would uh, uh, parachute into, into France uh, when uh, the U.S. and, and U.K. Uh, in, invaded France to, to kick out the Germans. Um, and so Eisenhower was very well known. Uh, kind of, he, was a, he was a war hero. And so the political parties in the U.S. and, and it, it wasn't really clear like which what his politics were. He like wasn't a politician. He had talked about politics, and so both the Democrats and the Republicans were like, "Hey Eisenhower, you want to you know be elected president for for us?" Um, uh, turned out that that he preferred the Republican Party, uh, and, and he ran in in 1952. Um, and as you might expect of a war hero, um, well, I should say he had this great campaign slogan: "I like Ike." His, his nickname uh, was, was Ike, um, but he, he crushed it, um, uh, defeated uh, the Democrat Adlai Stevenson. Um, not sure uh, why, but 
After Stevenson got crushed in 1952, uh, the Democrats' plan was, you know who we should run in 1956? Adlai Stevenson. Didn't come out any different. He got crushed, crushed again. Um, so Eisenhower was, was president during um, a period of tremendous economic growth and kind of geopolitical dominance of the United States. Um, he has been kind of criticized for uh, moving quite slowly to not at all on the issue of civil rights um, in the U.S., uh, though uh, he did, um, after the uh, Supreme Court uh, uh, ruled in Brown v. Board of Education that uh, educational segregation was, was not constitutional, uh, Eisenhower did send uh, the U.S. Army to uh, force integration of, of schools in, in the South. And, uh, but he, he's mostly remembered um, kind of on, the, on the foreign policy front, uh, this was the kind of beginning of the of the Cold War. So here's a map of uh, 1953, um, and you have uh, uh, the countries in in dark blue are kind of the the U.S. and its close military allies in in NATO. Um, the the lighter blue are kind of the the Western or U.S. aligned countries, countries that were seen to to favor uh, uh, the U.S. Um, Dark red is uh, the Soviet Union and kind of countries that it had some amount of direct political control over. Um, lighter red are, are those countries that were kind of aligned with, with um, uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and the green countries are those that were still uh, controlled as kind of colonial possessions, usually by uh, Britain or France. Um, uh, though the, the Dutch uh, had uh, territory and, and was now Indonesia. Um, and this was uh, um, kind of an, uh, an interesting outcome of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's death uh, before the end of the war is that he was uh, at least um, uh, uh, hard to know what he would have done, but he, he seemed to be very opposed to colonialism, wanted uh, the European uh, countries to... Uh, Give up these uh, uh, these colonial territories. Um, uh, Harry Truman did not share this outlook, um, nor did Dwight Eisenhower, uh, and so kind of the post-war world, um, the U.S. wanted the support of Britain and France uh, against the Soviet Union, and kind of uh, did things to sort of help them keep control of these uh, uh, of, of this territory. Um, which was sort of antithetical to kind of the the, the message of, of democracy that the, the U.S. had been had been spreading. Um, one particular way in which this manifested during Eisenhower's term and his uh, and his predecessors uh, was France uh, had what was then called French Indochina, um, but uh, now is is Vietnam and and uh, Laos. Um, and uh, the Japanese had, had conquered this territory during the war, and then the French came back in and immediately tried to sort of go back to, the, to exactly the way that, that uh, colonial things had, had been. And, of course, um, the, the, the people there were, uh, many of them were, did not want to be uh, ruled by the French, and so were, were fighting a war. Uh, the U.S. were supporting the French in this war, and then when the French lost and left, the U.S., of course, fought a war, the Vietnam War there as well, proceeded to make you know, all the same uh, mistakes that, that the, the French had made, all the same blindnesses. Uh, but now I'm pretty far afield from, from Eisenhower. So um, let's, let's go back to data structures. All right. How do we actually take advantage of our, of our parallel world here? Um, the... Kind of as uh, I alluded to in the kind of in how I describe parallelism, we had some work. We were going to divide it up. Um, uh, one common approach is called divide and conquer parallelism. Um, so you might 
So we might think of um, Uh, we have some task. We want to sum up the numbers in some in some array, and let's say this array is enormous. It's going to take. It would take a long time. Uh, like if it was just you know hundreds or thousands of, of numbers in this array, like whatever. But uh, we could. We don't need parallelism to to make that faster, but this array has tens of millions or billions of uh, elements, then it starts to, to take a long time. So uh, maybe our, we have uh, four CPUs, four cores in our, in our computer. Um, and maybe we <clears throat> to sort of divide up our work kind of between these four CPUs. Say, um, if, uh, if this is our very, very big array, uh, we divide it into four roughly equal pieces. I have uh, uh, CPU one sum up this piece, uh, two, three, and four kind of have different CPUs each sum up these four different pieces, and then we're left with four numbers, which we can add together very quickly. But by having different CPUs sum up different kind of chunks of this array, we can have how much faster do you think it would be to have kind of four CPUs each uh, uh, adding up a quarter of our array versus just one of it adding up all the array? Liam? It would just be four times faster. Yeah, exactly. Because we can kind of presumably adding up one quarter as many things takes one quarter of the time, and we're kind of doing all of these simultaneously. We kind of go four times, four times as fast. Um, so if I write my program this way, that I take the array and I specifically break it up into four parts. Um, and uh, uh, can I assume that any computer that I run my program on will have four CPUs? No, I, I obviously can't assume that. Um, and so I would say this approach is not portable, as in it's not easy to take this approach, which I wrote for this specific four CPU computer, and you know easily run it on some other computer with some different number of CPUs. So while this would kind of be pretty good at getting me probably close to four times as fast um, for for something of this array, uh, it has this issue where it's hard to hard to. It's sort of kind of specialized to this specific computer. Um, so our solution is going to be to create many, many threads, or at least many more than, than we have CPUs. Um, and when we have this sort of big pile of threads, so we, we we're saying, okay, we're going to divide up our big array into all these different chunks. Um, and even if we still have four CPUs, like a CPU adds up this chunk, and this chunk, and this chunk, and this chunk, and whenever a CPU finishes adding up one of these chunks, it moves on and works on another one, and then works through another one, and then works through another one. Um, and so by having all these kind of small parts of the task, 
it becomes much more flexible. Kind of whatever CPUs are available to us, they'll be working away through this sort of big pile of, of different threads that are all adding up different different parts of our of our big array. Does that make sense? Questions on that? All right, so um, yeah, so our kind of what um, the way that this is this is often done uh, in Java. Um, I guess first I'm going to ask you you to think about something. So um, uh, think about how you might sort of sketch out an algorithm for this kind of parallel sum, summing up of, of an array um, where uh, let's think of this as How would we do a recursive parallel sum? Um, which is like, think about how we have um, designed algorithms to kind of uh, recursively divide our problem into smaller and smaller pieces uh, in the past. Um, you might think of, of merge sort. Uh, we kind of divided up into smaller and smaller pieces that then we kind of sorted and combined back together. Um, so brainstorm with your, your neighbors for a few minutes, like how we might sort of uh, break up our, our task of summing up an array into different pieces, kind of where our parallelism might come in. Like if you could just like pick uh, certain, certain parts of the program to kind of happen at the same time, like what would that look like? Um, uh, let's come back together. Uh, so, anyone have a suggestion for a for a base case um, for uh, summing up a, an array? Liam, um, there's no more threads, I guess. Or nothing else to add. Yeah, so um, for what kind of array as input would we have like nothing to, to add up? There is empty or if there is only one element. Yeah, so we can say like if we have only one element, we just return it. Uh, that's that is the sum of the elements in that array. Um, otherwise, uh, if we're sort of thinking about this like merge sort or maybe binary search, we sort of split our work in half. Um, else, uh, in parallel. Kind of some have a thread like add up the left half, a thread add up the right half, uh, and then kind of take those results and kind of add them together. So essentially, programming languages are also coded. Uh, programming languages are also coded. Also coded? As in, this is how you would sort of add numbers in an array if you were using Java, for instance. Um, so if you want to see like how kind of how what the messy Java actually looks like to sort of add this up in parallel, that's what the the, the reading for today will like go through all the those messy details. Uh, but this is like conceptually the idea. Java's like doesn't make it look this nice, but yeah, we want to like 
go off and, and kind of simultane simultaneously add up the left half and the right half, and once we have both of those, add the results back together. Um, uh, just to uh, kind of show you a practical uh, example of this, um, I have a little Java program uh, that's going to create uh, three arrays that each have 10 million random uh, random uh, uh, integers in them. Um, oh, this I see. Oh no, 10, 10 million random random doubles rather. Um, and it turns out. Java in its library provides a sort function that will just sort an array. Uh, and it also provides a parallel sort function, which will create threads to sort this array in parallel. So uh, like, our, like our sum, you'd like sort the left half and sort the right half in parallel, um, and then combine the results. And so just to see like what's and kind of I'm, I'm timing how long sort of each of these uh, takes for um, uh, for the, the sequential and, and the parallel. I don't know why I did that. I just want to run this. And so while well, it's making the random input, it's sorting sequentially. Uh, and we can see that the sequential sort took 0.1 microseconds for e kind of on, on average for, for all our 10 million elements, while our parallel sort did orders of magnitude faster, 0 0.003 microseconds per, per element. So uh, when we have a task like sorting an array uh, where we can easily split it up into different pieces to do in parallel, we can get programs running much, much faster um, if we take advantage of that. All right, we are out of time for today, so I'll let you go. Um, uh, reminder that uh, the lab due on, on Friday, you are not able to use late days uh, on this lab. Uh, I, can't, uh, um, I, I can't give you extensions beyond the last day of class. Um, so uh, all office hours uh, in the lab tomorrow night, and see you Friday.